at the time it went off, it was, I think, absolutely, it wasn't, I knew sort of what would happen, but I didn't expect the heat from the flash at five miles away to be uh, nearly that intense. And then there was a cloud, sort of the radioactive cloud went and sort of hovered there. And I and Ken had been working on developing escape routes because if that thing had gone a little bit uh, south, it would have fallen then fall out on the camp and we would have to get out to the to the south rather than where the north was the road was to the north and um, so there was this sense of this ominous cloud uh, hanging over us it was so brilliant purple with all the radioactive glowing and it just seemed to hang there forever of course it didn't it, went, it was, must have been just a very short time for, t until it went up but it was very terrifying and the thunder from the blast um, it bounced on the rocks and then went, I don't know where else it bounced, but it never seemed to stop, and not like an ordinary echo of a thunder. It just kept echoing back and forth in that Jornado de Muerta. It was a very scary time when it, when it went off. Um, and God, I wish I could remember what my brother said, but um, I can't. Uh, but I think we just said it worked. <laughs> I think that's what we said, both of us, it worked, and nobody knew it was going to work. He was in the, uh, in the forward bunker, and then when he came back, there he was, you know, of his hat, you've seen pictures of that, Robert's hat and so on, and uh, he came to where we were, in the, in the headquarters, so to speak, and um, the way his walk was like high noon. I think it's the best I could describe it, this kind of strut. So. He'd done it. It felt like an earthquake. We lived in a good adobe house, and it just said, shh, shh. And he said, my goodness, that's an earthquake, and wonder if it hurt the house. And he got out of bed, and he got up, and he says, I want you to come look. The sun's rising in the long, wrong direction. Must have been nearly 20 miles away. Well, this is if somebody had set off a flash bulb right in your face. And completely blinded for, for about 30 seconds. Then gradually your vision cleared and you saw this huge orange and purple and green violently colored balls rolling up towards the sky. So. We knew something that happened over here, and we had a car along that had a radio in it. So we kept that radio on, and long at noon, they up and told us, you know, that there's an ammunition dump went off. We were headed up to Albuquerque to take her back to school, and we were between Palvadera and Limitar when we saw this great big flash of light. And my sister, she said, what happened? And that was, she got to see the light, and it just seemed like it lit up the whole but prairie all around us. Was there anything odd about your sister asking about the light? Yes, because she was blind. It didn't take very long. I was just after the first few minutes that I realized sort of viscerally what had happened and uh, had goose flesh all over of, the, of the consequences of what, what would happen to the world. When did you find out what happened? Well, it was quite a while, you know, and until they began to talk about the cattle, you know, that their hair was turning white on them, like frost, you know, it looked like they had frost on their backs and so forth. The way we noticed them was the, uh, where that fallout fell on the cow, if she's lying on her left side, well, her right side would get burned, and the uh, particles of dust that were radioactive would fall on her, and then they've caused a burn like a scald, and the hair, instead of coming back red, like on a Hereford cow, would come back white, just like a a saddle burn on a black horse. And old man Max Smith that had the white store up there had a black cat just as black as the ace of spades. And that thing had white spots all over it after the atomic blast. He sold it to some tourist for $5, I think, as a curiosity. Iwo Jima, Leyte Gulf, Mindanao, the Marshall Islands. At Okinawa alone, 50,000 American casualties. 110,000 Japanese casualties.
the beginning of the end for Japan. Saturation bombing. Thousands of B-29s raining incendiary bombs on all but a few cities. Harry Truman, who has assumed the presidency after Roosevelt's death in early 45, calls for total surrender. Our demand has been, and it remains, unconditional surrender. Japan was in ruins, most of her major cities destroyed, reduced to rubble. More than a million civilians dead, the Japanese fought on. Now, when the question of use came up, then I did have quite long discussions with Oppie uh, about how it might be used. And he did bring up to me one day that he would serve on a panel uh, to make a recommendation about the use of the bomb. So then uh, uh, I suggested to him that it would be a good idea if it would be used in a demonstration. Uh, uh, for example, as, uh, as the demonstration at Trinity, where Japanese observers might have been invited to attend. And I can remember very specifically when Oppenheimer brought up a counter-argument to that, that, well, supposing it didn't go off, and I turned to him coldly and said, well, we could kill them all. <laughs> and, uh, of course, I was not, uh, didn't say that for real, but even so, I was aghast at having even uh, to make a point that I had said such a bloodthirsty thing. Why did the bomb get dropped on people at Hiroshima? I would say it's almost inevitable that it would have happened, simply because all the bureaucratic apparatus existed by that time to do it. The Air Force was ready and waiting. There had been prepared big airfields in the island of Tinian in the Pacific from which you could operate. The whole machinery was ready. The president would have had to be a man of iron will in order to put a stop to it. The question was whether we wanted to save our people and Japanese as well and win the war or whether we wanted to take a chance on being able to win the war by killing all our young men. I don't think they would have developed that to show at a garden party. I think they had to do it and we felt this was our own defense. And also, there was a hurricane that would have wiped out a lot of our troops out there. And the poor old Japanese hadn't been very nice to us, John. They kind of demolished our Navy without any warning. It would have come out sooner or later in a congressional hearing, if nowhere else, just when we could have dropped the bomb if we didn't use it. And then, uh, knowing American politics, you know as well as I do that uh, there been elections fought on the basis that every mother whose son was killed after such and such a date, uh, the blood is on the head of the president. Americans braced themselves for a bloody invasion of the Japanese mainland. And uh, in those days, most people did not realize the qualitative difference between the atomic bomb and the number of ordinary bombs. There was really no uh, immediate feeling that the world is changing, as it is now, but rather that it would be a good way to win the war more quickly. So I would say it was nobody's fault that the bomb was dropped. As usual, the reason it was dropped was just that nobody had the courage or the foresight to say no. Certainly not Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer gave his consent in a certain sense. He was on a committee which advised the Secretary of War.